Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's meeting of Georgia River Council. I declare the meeting open at 7.08 p.m. I would like to acknowledge the beautiful people of the Eora Nation who are the traditional custodians of all lands, waters and sky in the Georgia River area. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who live, work and meet on these lands. Councillors and public, if we can please stand for the National Anthem. Australians all let us rejoice for we are one and free with golden soil and wealth for toil our home is God by sea our land abounds in nature's gifts of beauty rich and rare in for the opening prayer, which tonight will be led by the Revival Church. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for an opportunity to gather together to focus on our community. Father, I just praise you that you are God, we're not. So we pray for wisdom and revelation tonight. Father, as we, we, we work through issues, Lord, we just pray for peace and Lord God, for common sense to prevail. Lord, I pray for every counsellor and their family tonight, that you bless them for their service. And Lord, that you would be over this evening totally. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be all seated. There are no apologies for tonight's meeting and there has been no request to attend by visual audio link. Staff and public are reminded that this meeting is being recorded for, for minute-taking purposes and is also being webcast on Council's website. This recording will be made available on Council's website. The order of business is as shown in the agenda and Council's code of meeting practice prohibits the electronic recording of meetings without the express permission of Council. Councillors, uh, I have a declaration of interest from Councillor Blue. Uh, Councillor Lou has declared a non-significant, non-procurement non interest in item CCL 010-24, applications pursuant to Council Award Discretionary Fund, uh, February 2024. Councillor Lou will remain in the meeting and take part in consideration and voting on this item. There have been 12 submissions received for tonight's meeting. Submissions 1, 3, 4, 5, 7, 11 and 12 will be read to the meeting by staff. All other submissions will be read to the meeting by the speakers. I would like to remind the speakers that speakers have a three limit time limit. The first sound that you hear indicates that you have one minute left. And on the second sound, if I could kindly ask you to conclude your comments. The first speaker tonight, uh, the first submission tonight is from Kate Burford. Uh, it's a written submission and it will be read by council staff. Thank you. I am in strong support of this motion. As a local parent of two children, there are currently no water play areas in the local area, and one would provide vital recreation for children during our increasingly hot summers. I have spoken with a number of other parents in my area who agree that they would use a water play area with their own children, some with, with some currently traveling to Marrickville or Greenacre to use water play parks there. 
Thank you for considering the motion. Thank you. The next the next submission is from Tina Jamani. Uh, it's in person. Thank you, Tina. And Tina is speaking on NM 018-24 Douglas Cross Gardens, repurposing the fountain area. Uh, good evening, councillors. Uh, thank you so much for having me tonight. Uh, I am here to save the fountain at Douglas Cross Gardens at Oatley train station. Um, a few months ago, actually, uh, I was here at the council and I was fortunate enough to have won a historical marker uh, in Oatley. And, you know, George's River Council does invest in historical markers, but something that we need to invest in is maintaining and sustaining those historical sites. Uh, and the fountain at, at Oatley Railway Station is one of those sites. And, I think council has the, um, the the responsibility to look after community and to make it livable, a livable community and a beautiful environment for people, create pride in people's environment. And that's part and parcel of sustaining and maintaining and fixing this fountain that's 60 years old. Um, it's been a historical icon of Oatley in the centre of Oatley. It is the hub of our village and we're well known. It's a cohesive uh, uh, community and the fountain is part of that. Everybody knows the fountain. Uh, it's been many people that have had their wedding photos taken there uh, and there's a lot of emotion amongst residents. I'm a, I've been there for 30 years. I've lived in Oatley and for the last four years the fountain has not been operational and it was built in 1969 and has been operational all this time and now all of a sudden we don't want to invest in it. Uh, and making communities livable and making them aesthetic and making people proud of where they live is an important part of being a councillor and being a good council. So you really need to get behind and save this fountain. I know that uh, the residents are ready to protest, petition, raise money, and we really ask you to invest and fix the fountain. There's only one gardener that looks after the whole of the gardens at Oatley, and that's an impossible task. And this has been reduced down from two and three gardeners over the years. So we ask you invest in gardeners, invest in the greenery, and retain this fountain and keep the community happy. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. The next speaker tonight is Gillian Cheng. It's a written submission and it's on motion NM014-24, review of safety and security measures at Percival Aquatic Leisure Centre. I'm one of the victims from the theft incident happened on 16 November 2023 in Hurstville Aquatics Leisure Centre. When I went to shower after swimming, all my personal belongings, clothes, shoes and pants, including car key in my pocket, has been stolen. I parked my car in the underground car park, but there is no surveillance camera and my car had been stolen too. My iPhone and wallet in the car with 700 cash, as well as credit cards, had been taken. Fraud transaction, $737.50. I even saw the two suspects, but the only security camera in the centre was facing the ground at that time. Most lockers are broken, no battery or occupied. I strongly support this motion, NM01424, to review safety and security measures at Hurstville Aquatic Leisure Centre. Thank you. The next speaker tonight is Frank Chen. Uh, also a written submission on the same uh, motion, and that'll be read by Council staff. I provide this statement in support of Councillor Wang's submission for the review of safety and security measures at Hurstville Aquatic Leisure Centre. I was one of the patrons whose belongings were stolen in the incident that happened at the centre on 16 November 2023. My swimming bag containing my mobile phone was stolen in the changing room while I was in the shower. Another patron suffered much greater loss. He had his car taken, wallet and keys stolen at the same time. We understand that every person is responsible for their own personal items and we don't deny this responsibility but the centre also shares responsibility for keeping the venue safe and secure for its members or anyone who use the facilities. We reported the above incident to the police on the day, but it was concerning 
and disappointing to learn that there was no adequate security device at the entrance exit of the centre or the device were malfunctioning. We also learnt that there was no adequate monitoring of the car park. It would be much easier if the offenders were caught by the security cameras that can be used to assist with police for their jobs in finding them. What has happened is an opportunity for the centre to improve or enhance its measures to prevent this from happening again and to better protect all patrons using the facilities. Yes. Thank you. Next speaker is Dr Don Wang, written submission, and that is on uh, Merrill Minute 001-24. Congratulations to council officers for the summer events program. I'm writing to express my gratitude to Georges River Council, Councillor Nancy Liu and her school museum and gallery for supporting my exhibition, Empyrean Landscape, the Year of the Dragon during the 2024 Lunar New Year celebration. Hurstville is a place that has a very big population of Asian Australians. Thanks to Hurstville Museum and Gallery for providing this great opportunity for community artists to apply and exhibit their work in the Dragon's Lair Gallery. This year, I have the honour to be selected to have my Empyrean Landscape, the Year of the Dragon exhibition in the Dragon's Lair Gallery of the Hurstville Museum and Gallery. My gratitude is to Hurstville Museum and Gallery staff, Claire Baddeley, Renee Porter, Stephanie mccarthy Reese, and Laura Martinez for their strong support. Thanks especially to curator Claire Baddeley, who has helped me with every aspect of this show, writing text and conducting artist interviews and published many materials online. Give me advice on how to successfully apply for Creative New South Wales funding. Help me install the show with professional standards, including excellent lighting to make the works, works look beautiful and worked on the label to make the show look professional. Many thanks also to the staff who have worked on social media continuously to promote and inviting distinguished guests and general audience to attend. Setting up the venue organised a very successful opening event. Claire Baddeley, Beth McRae, Cultural Coordinator at Hurstville Museum and Gallery, Alexandra Malcolm, Alini Katharanis, both worked on front reception, Joanna Williams and two volunteers, Ruth Shalabi and Yang Yu. Many thanks to Hurstville Councillor Nancy Liu for her wonderful opening speech, which has given meaning to the dragon symbolism in my artwork. Thanks also to Anita Velilovsky from Georges River Council's communication staff for her advice and help during the ABC News TV interview. Thanks to Laura Martinez for coordinating my dragon painting workshop during the exhibition period. Thanks to council designer, Rianne Potter, for design the half page ads for advertising in the Art Almanac. There are many other works done behind the scene that I am also very grateful. Lastly, thanks again to Hurstville Museum and Gallery for giving me this wonderful opportunity to showcase my work. And thanks to Georges River Council for building Hurstville, such a vibrant and multicultural society. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Mr. Adrian Polhill. Uh, and Adrian will be speaking on NM011-24, source separation of return and earth eligible containers at public places. Litter bins. Good, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to speak to you. This is a brilliant uh, opp opportunity to continue the education campaign about recycling and reusing. I fully support the motion put forward by Councillor Peter Marnie. I, I believe there's a, still a big gap according to the New South Wales government website. Only two out of three of these containers are being redeemed. So there's a, a huge uh, opportunity for everyone to educate the public even more so that we can capture that last third, that one in three of redeemable containers that are not being put through this particular scheme. So I believe it's a great opportunity, a super, a super, uh, um, a super innovation, I think, by the council to bring a trial about and also a great opportunity to continue to educate the public. So I urge you to move forward as quickly as you can and also perhaps to link that when you have these trial bins in place, link it to the New South Wales government website so people can find the exact location where they can actually uh, put, for, or put their uh, redeemable containers. A great education for education as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Next speaker is Mr. Eric Young. Uh, next speaker is Mr. Eric Young, NM005-24, Acknowledgement and Appreciation of Can Revive, and that'll be read out by council staff. 
I wish to speak in support of Councillor Nancy Lou's motion uh, NM00524, Acknowledgement and Appreciation of Can Revive. I am Eric Young, President of Can Revive Incorporated, a benevolent institution established 28 years ago to support Chinese speaking people affected by cancer. Can Revive's Southern Sydney Support Centre has been operating continuously at Park Road, Hurstville over the last 16 years to service the communities in the southern region of Sydney. Can Revive has enjoyed tremendous support from the Georges River Council and formerly both Hurstville and Cogra Councils through many grants to support Can Revive's projects that enhance the wellbeing of people affected by cancer in the community. Can Revive is particularly thankful for Councillor Lou's efforts in connecting Can Revive to other community groups like St George Community Alliance Incorporated, Australia Wenzhou Chamber of Industry and Commerce, Australia Fijian Chamber of Commerce, who all contributed to support Can Revive's programs to assist people affected by cancer. All these efforts epitomise three overriding principles of the current New South Wales Cancer Plan, equity of outcomes, person-centredness and collaboration. Again, I would like to thank Georges River Council for all our community partners for your support for those who are most vulnerable in our community. Thank you. Next speaker is Mr Tony Bador, uh, speaking on NM004-24 Local Street Activation. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you all. I have some familiar faces. I'm conscious of time. I just want, uh, I'm here to speak, obviously, in favour of um, the motion um, for local street activation as obviously proposed by Councillor Lou. I met with Councillor Lou a few, uh, a few weeks ago, probably early February, and she mentioned that she was going to put together a motion in regards to the street activation, obviously, beautification of some of the shop fronts. And for me, obviously, in my usual sort of tone, cut her off with excitement because it, it spoke to exactly what the four pillars or the fourth pillar of the four pillars is, which is beautification and activation of uh, our, our public areas. From the, from the Chamber's perspective, we support this motion because coincidentally, a week before we had actually met, the executive had actually agreed and passed a admitted motion to propose to the council uh, uh, to allow for a, a, a budget or amount, whatever it may be, we were looking about 250 to $300 per eligible, eligible shop front. To, to go towards obviously a campaign of beautifying and, and, and getting the shop fronts looking obviously presentable and uh, more importantly neat and, and presentable to be able to invite people to come in. So from our perspective, this sat quite well in the four pillars for us. So from from the chamber perspective, I'm standing here saying that we do we will support we will support in any way possible, whether it be a written submission or or a letter of support of some sort for this, because we believe it's important for, for shop fronts to to look good in whether it be the council, whether it be the Hurstville or the Cogra precinct, it's important that we see this uh, a constant improvement in the presentation. Not to say that it isn't good at the moment, but we always room to improve. Now in saying that too, we also want to say that from the council's from the chamber's perspective, we also do want to see that in, in the event that the grant is um, successful, and we, we're, we're positive it will be, we'd like to partner uh, the, uh, the council in ensuring whatever initiatives are planned under this grant uh, are delivered successfully through our membership. Our membership is growing and our voice is growing, and we think we can be a good partner in that sense um, to be able to ensure that if this grant is successful, that we'll be able to partner in a positive way and in a positive manner to ensure that and what we want to see, to be honest, is, is obviously when the initiative and initiatives are held, and you guys have been doing a great job today doing that, but there's always room to improve. And we want to see, you know, some engagement with the businesses as well. So when, in, in the sense of in, in, in educating them on when, when the programs are coming, um, you know, traffic plans, parking, all that kind of stuff, and infrastructure that our members are always sort of raising around events. I mean, they're excited about the events and they want to see more events to encourage foot traffic. But more importantly, they actually want to, be part of the process and be kept informed. So we, we hopefully can get that um, sort of engagement together and work together to improve that and ensure that these programs are a success. But we do want to say good luck with the application and we're here to support if we can. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Next speak tonight. Yeah. Uh, next speak tonight is Sam Nadil uh, speaking on a question we've noticed 003 24. Update on the traffic study proposed for the area surrounding Oatley Railway Station. Thank you, Sam. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. 
Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak tonight. I'm speaking on behalf of pedestrians and my son and many school children and elderly people who catch the train from Oakley Station on the western side. Over the years, we have requested council to install a pedestrian crossing for all communities who cross Mogga Road in the morning and afternoon and access the station safely. It's interesting to note here that uh, within 200 metres of the station on the eastern side, there are five pedestrian crossings, whereas on the western side of the station, there are none. So, my 15-year-old son, who attends the school in Stratfield, has been catching a train in the morning and returns in the afternoon, two of the busiest periods of the day, morning and afternoon, where traffic in and around Oakley Station is extremely busy. He has been doing this from the age of 10, and my wife and I have had to have take turns in escorting him across the road. Over the years, there have been a number of uh, near misses with school students and commuters trying to cross the road and in the mornings, let alone the afternoons, to catch a train. This is fraught with danger since traffic heading west from Oatley Parade under the bridge, turning left into Mulga Road onto or up River Road, comes zooming around the bend without sh uh, slowing down. So this driver behaviour catches pedestrians unaware and they are left standing on the traffic island waiting for cars to continue on their way. I don't believe standing in the middle of the road is a safe practice for anybody. With the increase of electric vehicles and buses, it has become increasingly difficult to hear them approaching uh, Mulga Road from under the bridge. My wife and I have had to position ourselves from both sides as so we could see vehicles approaching. On another matter, um, of a morning and afternoon, students from GRC, Georgia River Campus, crossed two pedestrian crossings and one set of traffic lights at Hillcrest Avenue in, to access the school. I believe this safer option for students from GRC to alight from Wardale Station, walk past Wardale School and Carina School along Colborne Avenue and into Judd Street to access the campus grounds without crossing a road and disrupting traffic flow in and around Oatley Station. This will alleviate traffic issues, hold ups at Oatley as they cross two pedestrian crossings east of the station, stopping the movement of traffic both ways, heading east or west under the bridge. We must bear in mind that this train bridge is low and on its sides and high trucks and buses must drive in the centre, slowing down and creating more traffic congestion. In conclusion, we believe the ideal position for a pedestrian crossing is to be placed directly in line with the lift entry on Mulga Road. Before the station was upgraded, we viewed plans which had a pedestrian crossing drawn in this exact position. This is an ideal location as pedestrians have vision of traffic coming from both directions, that is from Mulga Road shops and from entering Mulga Road from River Road heading west. And further to the GRC students issue, the school principal needs to be contacted and be informed about these problems in one in our community, which can be resolved with her cooperation in this matter. I thank Councillor Peter Marnie for putting this matter on the agenda, and I look forward to Council completing the traffic study this financial year so that these serious safety and congestion issues can be urgently rectified. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Next speaker is Mr. James Hamilton. Uh, we'll be speaking on items NM016-24 and NM018-24, proposed Ellen Subway raised pedestrian crossing uh, and Douglas Cross Gardens repurposing fountain area. Thank you, James. Uh, good evening, councillor and or mayor and councillors. Thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight once again. Um, first, I'd like to address Council on the Water Features in Douglas Cross Gardens in Oatley. <clears throat> there was once quite a stunning fountain in Oatley Memorial Gardens, sort of out the front of Oatley Pub. Uh, across the road in Douglas Cross Gardens, there was another fountain, a unique water feature that consisted of a series of waterfalls and streams throughout the park. Both of these public assets, assets were much loved and, and admired by people who lived both locally and those who lived out of the area, as evidenced by uh, Douglas Cross Gardens being a very popular place for wedding photos, as well as families and kids enjoying what it was a unique water feature. Years ago, I noticed that the Fountain in Oakland Memorial Gardens had ceased functioning. I thought it was a temporary thing, but sadly it's since been filled in as, and is now a garden bed. I was walking through Douglas Cross Gardens a few weeks back and was genuinely shocked at the state of the fountain and the water features in that park. 
None of it was operational and the pond at the bottom of the water was full of dirt, debris and rubbish and quite frankly looked rather sad and pathetic. I've since been informed that the plan for the fountain and the water features in Douglas Cross Gardens is to permanently decommission them and turn the water feature into some into more garden beds. In early February, I know, when I posted a photo of it on the Oatley Neighbourhood Group Facebook page a few weeks back, some of the responses were, it was stunning back in the day, repair this once beautiful garden that was once a showpiece of Oatley, it was a beautiful feature, it's sad that they don't see the need to maintain it like they used to. Having said that, that, I'd like to highlight to Council that there were plenty of positive comments on the state of the gardens themselves and what a good job that the Council does in maintaining the actual gardens. Reading the Georges River Council Asset Management Plan 2023-24, I note the following points. Georges River Council is committed to ensuring that the community of today receive quality infrastructure and that sufficient funds are directed to maintain these assets for future generations. The general principles of the asset accounting policy are existing assets are managed efficiently. Also in the plan, it says there are a consistent theme across all asset classes where we currently do not allocate enough budget to sustain these services at the expected standard or to provide all new services being sought. Given that, I urge Council to direct the necessary funds to re-establish this once well-loved and unique feature. Secondly, and I'll be quick, I want to state my opposition to the proposed raised pedestrian crossing on Ellen, Ellen Subway in Mortar. I believe that the current design will result in restricted traffic conditions, particularly those coming from the southern side of the train line under Ellen Subway in, into Mortdale. Currently, the traffic is often banked up underneath the bridge of Ellen Subway and the flow of traffic on railway parade is affected. Once the new units on and next to Ellen Subway are completed and occupied, traffic flow is only going to be more of a problem than it currently is. A raised pedestrian crossing with restricted traffic conditions will only add to the current problem. It appears to me anecdotally as a local person that the traffic and streetscape planning in Mortdale and Oatley is done on an ad hoc basis with no whole of suburb approach by the council. I say this because there seems to be almost constant change to street signage in regards to parking restrictions. For example, in Oatley by the station, there was a kiss and ride sign that was removed a few months ago. People are now being fined, stopping illegally, not knowing that they're the signs have been removed, but now the signs are back. It just seems to be all very ad hoc. Um, so I urge Council to take a whole of suburb approach to designing the streetscape in relation to parking and pedestrian access and to rethink the proposed design that will restrict traffic flow in Ellen Subway. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, next speaker is Joe uh, Vitigliano. Uh, NM 017-24, NM 016-24, rectification works in Mortdale shopping area and proposed Ellen Subway raised pedestrian crossing. That'll be read out by council staff, sorry. My family are the owners of IGA. The Mortdale shopping strips have been going on from 7th November 2021. The works need to be finished as they are OHS issues with holes everywhere. The footpath was redone by council and now they are digging it up with potholes everywhere. IGA building walls are dirty from splashback and cutting the footpath again. They plant trees in front of signs at crossings. As for crossing works, the foot traffic from school is about 10 minutes. Why would council be spending money changing road and restricting, restricting trucks from turning into road? Why not have traffic control people control crossing? If nothing else, we have learnt the importance of consulting properly. The Mortdale streetscape was not consulted properly and didn't consider traffic and parking. Our business has have lost between 10 and 20% of revenue because of the streetscape. Please start consulting with the businesses and work with us. Thank you. Next speaker is Matt Allison on NM015-24, cost shifting for Beach Watch program. And Matt will be speaking to us remotely. We're just contacting him. Hello. Hi. Hi, Matthew. You've got the floor. Uh, you can address okay. the council. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, good evening, Council of staff and fellow citizens. Sorry that I couldn't join you tonight in person. 
I hope that I don't drop out as well as on one of the opening park mobile phone tower objectives. And consequently, we don't enjoy a particularly good mobile service. They love it. Now, the Beach Watch program has been a state government funded program since 1985 to test pollution and contamination levels at natural sw public swimming areas and alert and advise swimmers of the risk of contamination before they take the plunge. George's River Council at LGA had three such swimming areas, Oatley Park Bars, Oatley Pleasure Grounds Netted Area and Cars Park Netted Beach. Being upriver from the Great Dilute, the ocean, and relying on tidal flows for clean contaminants brought down from street drains, our river suffers most after rain events. When a rain event arrives in our local area, ailing Sydney water infrastructure, namely sewer pipes, literally um, poos itself as stormwater enters the system and water pressure in the pipes is released, discharging effluent into the tributaries that feed our river. The nasties detected may render our local waters unswimmable for days. This regular water testing program responsible for keeping Sydney's beaches pristine has had a funding cut, meaning from July 2024, all councils who choose to use the Beach Watch service will now have to pay for their own collection and testing. Now is not the time to defund Beach Watch, especially given the recent news that the Minns government is embarking on a radical rise in housing density throughout Sydney suburbs. Our current creeks and wetlands will not cope with the influx of stormwater and sewage out of the floods into our river. Sydney Water Corporation must be made accountable for the regular discharges and devise a better system to cope with the addition of over 100,000 new homes in the Sydney Basin. In the meantime, perhaps Sydney Water Corporation could be making up the shortfall and not expect Council to dig into its finite budget to fund Beach Watch. Council should not be getting off scot free though. Building sites are notorious for not arresting sediment from their works and it ending up in the street and then the river. We have a scheme already, get the site right, which you're fully aware of. But according to the EPA, only half of the developers successfully implement erosion and sediment controls to protect local environments. And councils and regulators still had to hand out $380,000 in fines in May of 2023. Surely we can do better and enforce the law on to recalcitrant builders alike. So after a few years hiatus, we now have Streamwatch fully funded and we have expectations that Beach Watch will be similarly fund fully funded, leaving council unencumbered and swimmers fully aware of the state of our swimming bars before they dive in and these. Thanks for listening and see you in the flesh next time. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, We move on to confirmation of minutes of previous meetings. Uh, first item on the agenda is CCL 003-24, confirmation of minutes of the council meeting held on the 18th of December. Councillors, do I have a motion? Moved by Councillor Smirdley, seconded by Councillor Jamison. Uh, I'll put the motion, all those in favour say aye. All those against, clear that carried. Next item on the agenda is CCL 004-24, confirmation of the minutes of the extraordinary meeting held on the 12th of February. By the motion of council, Councillor Nancy Lee moved, seconded by Councillor Fakara. Councillors, uh, do we have any objection? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Councillors, I have a couple of mayoral minutes uh, that I have before you and up on the screen as well. First mayoral minute uh, is congratulations to council officers for the summer events program. And the background is there, councillors. Um, I'll take that as read. But the motion is that council congratulates all council staff involved in the delivery of the summer events program over the period of December 2023 to February 2024. I'll put the motion, councillors, all those in favour say aye. All the, uh, sorry, Councillor, Councillor Lou, did you want to make some comments? Sure, yeah. Councillor Lou. Oh, thank you, Mr. May. Thank you for this um, motion being put up to uh, appreciate all the uh, council staff, especially the uh, directors, managers and events team to put all these uh, summer events uh, in front of uh, the general public in our Georgian River area. Um, 
we feel as part of the community, we feel, we feel so uh, proud. We feel so lucky that uh, we really had a, a very um, uh, colorful and in different variety of this uh, summer event, especially I want to emphasize on the, the Lunar New Year. Why I wanted to do this because um, this year in um, Chinese culture or some of the Asian background culture is the year of dragon. Uh, in, in our council's logo, we have a Georgia, so you can see uh, it's really kind of a, a, a dragon to represent the council's spirit and both um, and at both our connections with the wider St. George area and council aim to be a positive leader um, of the change. So, and also um, a thank for the staff to put up uh, a New Year dragon statue in the uh, Hersu uh, Plaza. The dragon called a Pogo is really coming from a legend uh, from St. George, uh, uh, really um, the story. It really has the connections with the uh, the Western dragon and the uh, the Eastern dragon in connection to the um, uh, the Chinese uh, mythology as well. So dragons in Chinese uh, um, mythology traditionally is, uh, symbolize power and strength. So it really connected to our council's spirit as well. So that's uh, the things I really want to emphasize. And uh, of course, um, uh, in good taste uh, festival that uh, uh, symbolize the end of the whole summer event. So uh, as um, the chair of the um, community and culture, I really wanted to um, support, um, uh, not, yeah, of course support Mr. Mayor's um, uh, Mirror Minute. So we wanted to all thank to the council staff. We wanted to really looking forward to next year, some summer season. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Lou. Uh, councillors, any more speakers? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. The next mineral minute is cost shifting onto local government. Uh, again, councillors, there's quite a detailed background there. Um, I'll take that as read. Uh, motion is uh, up there before you on the screen. I'm happy to go through it if any councillors want me to. No, there being none, so I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. We move on to condolences, and I have a number of condolences. Uh, first condolence, uh, Councillor Kanyaski. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, I said and report the passing of uh, Mortdale legend, all-round good Samaritan and good guy, Eric Percy Pratter. Eric, born on the 30th of January 1939 and passed away February the 14th, 2024. Eric passed away uh, the Thursday before last at the age of 85. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, sorry. Eric passed away the Thursday before last at the age of 85. He spent most of his working life with Aboriginal children in remote missions around Australia and later at Boys Town in Engadine. Most locals would remember Eric as the guy who decorated Mortdale at his own expense during the Christmas season over many years with tinsel and Christmas paraphernalia. Eric even made the Channel 9 News in 2016 because of his generous efforts to beautify our suburb. Eric's family have asked if the community could raise some funds to cover the costs of some Australian native flower arrangements for his casket. Uh, anyone interested can make a donation in the bucket at Mortdale Wishbone Chicken Shop. A funeral service will be held very Thursday, the 29th of February at 10 a.m. in the Church of Latter day Saints, 12 Kem Street, Mortdale. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kanyowski. The next uh, condolence motion is from Councillor Symington. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, on the 22nd of December 2023, Charles Richard Jarvis, a resident of the George River LGA for over 66 years, passed away. Charles was a loving husband to Helen, his wife of 54 years, an adored father to Elizabeth and Vanessa, and a doting grandfather to his four children, and a, fen a friend to many. Charles, or Charlie, as he was often affectionately known, was born in England on the 15th of February 1945, and his family immigrated to Australia in 1950, eventually settling at Jewfish Point in 1957. Once he and Helen married, they settled in Rainbow Parade Peakhurst Heights, where they raised their family. This was his home for half a century, and he loved living there. Charles became an Australian citizen in 1980, 
but he always retained his very posh English accent, and this led to his nickname Sir Charles at his last workplace. In the early 80s, Charles decided to switch occupations from the life insurance industry to state railways because of the security that a government job offered. He started at the bottom by cleaning diesels at Everly and then progressed to a driver's offsite, a fireman. Later on, a position became available closer to home at Mortdale, so became a driver of electric trains. Charles also took on the role of the depot's union representative, and he was a constant thorn in the management side. They would always want to cut corners, and he would have none of that. In desperation, they offered him a management role to shut him down, which, of course, he refused. Charles was black and white. There was no grey. He, he was your staunch ally or a formidable foe. At 56, Charles took a redundancy offered by management, but by this time it was too good to refuse, and he spent his retirement years supporting Helen in the maintenance of Peakhurst Foreshore Reserve. He was the unofficial catering supervisor for the bush care team and mowed and maintained the fire trails and surrounds when it was accessible. He also built possum boxes and bird boxes to provide them safe refuge for nesting and placed the boxes in the surrounding trees on the reserve. I'm going to miss my discussions with him along with listening to his stories and his jokes. He always put a smile on my face. Charles was an honourable man, full of integrity and kindness. He also had a fine sense of humour, a rare breed these days, and he will be sorely missed by everyone who had the absolute privilege of knowing him. Thank you. Our next condolence motion comes from Councillor Smirley. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it, it gives me great sadness to talk about uh, Father Nicholas Bazikas, who passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, Father Nicholas was a big figure in the uh, Greek Orthodox community here in St. George, but also across New South Wales. Um, Father Nicholas, just a brief history on Father Nicholas. Uh, he was born in 1944 on the Greek island of Zakynthnos. Um, he received Orthodox education at Ecclesiastes School of Holy Monastery of St. Anastasia in Vasiliki of Thessaloniki. He emigrated to Australia in 1964 and initially settled in Melbourne before relocating to Sydney in 1970 at the invitation of the late Archbishop Ezekiel of Australia. There he was ordained to priesthood and served within the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of Australia in Sydney for more than 50 years. For 18 years, Father Nicholas served the, the parish community of the Holy Cross in Wollongong before returning to Sydney in 1988. Father Nicholas was the parish priest at St. Spirit on Greek Orthodox Church in Kingsford from 1989 um, to 1994. He also served at St. Stephanos in Pilsen Park in 2011. Um, despite his health challenges in 2011, he eagerly resumed his priestly duties and served for an additional six and a half years in various parishes across New South Wales. Um, that's it. That's the official statement from the Greek church, but I'd also like to say that uh, my family knew Father Nicholas quite very well. Um, he baptised me as a, as a young kid um, at or two years old, um, and that's how no, I became one with uh, the Greek Orthodox parish, but um, he was also a big, a big family friend of uh, our family, and it just gives me great sadness to say that he passed away. So thank you. Councillor Catrus. Yes, just a quick word. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Look, I did know Father, Father Bazikis quite well. Um, he's a very dignified man, a very spiritual man, and he delivered his faith in a very formidable way and a very quiet and sensitive man. To say that he was um, well liked by the Greek Orthodox community is an understatement. He was respected and and um, very well liked. At the time when uh, Father Bozikis was um, the parish priest for Kingsford, um, the only, and it was a rather large Greek parish, the only other church which challenged the, the Kingsford Church as the rather, rather largest parish was the, um, the okay. Greek Orthodox Church of Marrickville and then it became the Greek Orthodox Church of Cogra. The man is actually is going to be sadly missed by the broader Greek Orthodox community and not only the Greek Orthodox community but many others. Um, my condolences go to him and his family. Our condolences go to him and his family. And um, Let's hope he rests in peace. 
Thank you, Councillor Catrus. Uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to all the families and friends touched by these three individuals, and we uh, pay our respects to all of them. If I could kindly ask everyone to be up for a moment of silence. Thank you. We move on to committee reports. The first committee report is uh, item CCL 005-24, report of the Assets and Infrastructure Committee meeting held on the 12th of February. Uh, I'll go to the chair of that committee, Councillor Kanyaski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I move the recommendations of the Assets and Infrastructure meeting held on the 12th of February, 2024. Moved by Councillor Kanyaski, seconded by Councillor Smirtley. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Next item on the agenda is CCL 006 24, reported the Community and Culture Committee meeting held on the 12th of February 2024. Uh, Councillor Nancy Lou. Thank you. I just would like to uh, adopt it as a, it's a printed in the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lou. Moved by Councillor Lou, seconded by Councillor Smirtley. Uh, is there any discussion on this matter? There being none, I'll put the motion, councillors. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Next item on the agenda is CCL 007-24, report in the Environment and Planning Committee meeting held on the 12th of February, 2024. Councillor Marnie. Mr. Smith? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to move the recommendation that the Environment and Planning Committee recommendations for items ENV 00224 to ENV 00624 be adopted by Council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Marnie. Seconded by Councillor Lansbury. Uh, Councillors, any discussion on those items? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Next item is CCL 008 24, report of the Finance and Governance Committee meeting held on the 12th of February. Uh, moved by Councillor um, Jamison. Sorry, Councillor Jamison. Uh, moved by Councillor Jamison. So, as per the recommendation, I take it, yes? Yes. Uh, and seconded by Deputy Mayor Borg. Uh, Councillors, any discussion on those items? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Next item is CCL 009 24. The 2024 National General Assembly of the Local Government Conference to be held in Canberra in July 2024. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Um, that the, re the recommendation is that councils nominate the Mayor Almir, Councillor Stankopoulos, and Councillor Kanjaski to attend the National Gander General Assembly of Local Government held in Canberra. Oh, Council and sorry, and um, sorry, and Councillor Smoothly. Sorry. Um, of local government held in Canberra on 2, 2nd to 4th of July. And point B, that council nominate the mayor to be the voting delegate to represent Georges River Council during debates on motions presented to the assembly. Uh, moved by Councillor Jamison, seconded by Councillor Stratacopoulos. Uh, Councillors, any further amendments to that? Any other councillors that wish to attend? There being none, any discussion? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Uh, next item is CCL 010-24, uh, applications pursuant to Council Award Discretionary Fund Policy February 2024. Councillor Jamison. I move the recommendation that the applications for funding, as outlined in the report, pursuant to the Councillor's Board Discretionary Fund Policy be approved by Council. Thank you, Councillor Jamison, seconded by Councillor Marnie. Any discussions on that, councillors? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. The next item on the agenda is CCL 011-24, report on outstanding council resolutions up to and including 31st of December 2023. Councillor Jamison. I move that the outstanding council resolutions period up to and including 31st of December be received and noted by council. Thank you, Councillor Jamison. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Liu. Uh, councillors, any discussions on that? 
there being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. We now move on to notices of motion. The first notice of motion is 001-24, Kempfield update on community involvement uh, by Councillor Lou, uh, seconded by Councillor Symington. Um, is there any objection to this motion? Any discussion on this motion? There, there will be. Oh, it's some commentary? Okay. Uh, Councillor Lou, I'll give you the floor. Sorry, Councillor. Yep, Councillor Lou has the floor. Thank you, Mr. May. Um, so I wanted to put up this uh, motion as a, um, individual three points. Uh, that the first one, Council keep the public informed of the updated information on this project. The Council erect a safety size along Roberts Avenue, which is a, a very narrow laneway towards the car park area and other surrounding areas in need due to the fences around the playground. That the Council assure the community is involved towards future plan on children's um, playground. I, I think as a community, uh, we will realize that um, this uh, uh, field has been closed since, uh, I think, 2023, December, before, I think, before Christmas and the, the, the New Year time. And uh, thank you for Council's department um, um, and the director, Andrew Letter, continues to meet, meet with the New South Wales Department of Planning and Environment, which is the owner of this land. Um, so I just try to emphasize that uh, because it's, a, it's not a happen overnight, it, it will need time to get the, the final solution. So thank you for council. Could uh, uh, keep the uh, public informed. So uh, can I, um, Asked uh, Andrew to give us a bit of. I, I understand that two weeks ago that uh, you had the meeting with the planning and uh, uh, the department, right? Thank you. To the director. Uh, through you, Mr. May. Yes, yeah, so the department have now provided a timeline for delivery. Uh, they'll commence um, investigative work at the end of February. That will lead to closure of, um, of the, the laneway uh, adjacent to, um, to Kent Field. They're then going to be working through to develop a remediation action plan. So at this stage, I've indicated that we should have a remediation action plan by um, by July 2024. Thank you, Director. Um, Councillor Lou, any further comments? Uh, no, thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Lou. Uh, to the second of the motion, Councillor Symington. Sorry. Uh, sure, happy to go to questions. Yep, Councillor. Thanks, Mr. Lynn. Um, Director Ladder, can you just clarify? Did you say to say that Robert Lane is going to Robert Lane is going to be closed? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, that's the um, proposal while they're doing the investigative work on that site, uh, where that um, portion of the car park has collapsed. Um, they'll need to do some investigation in that particular area just to find what um, what works would be necessary moving forward. So I think there will be a temporary closure of Robert's, um, Robert's Lane for a period of time. The residents will be notified prior to. Sorry, Councillor Sonnington, Councillor Lansbury has more questions. Hi. Yeah, just the mic. Yeah. Um, that, of course, is where all the residents access their garages and they'll have nowhere else to park. So I hope that there is plenty of notification for them to access. I mean, I have another question, but I'm just commenting on that because that's the first time I've heard of that. Um, and it's very difficult parking wise now. And that's how they access. That's where they put their rubbish bin. So, you know, that's going to be a difficult situation to manage. My question relates to part B of the motion. I support part A and C, but I'm confused as to why we have part B in there because we do have an, a quite a lot of signage along the entire fence and I recall asking you um, Mr Ladder some time ago if we could get some in uh, or a few different languages to capture some of the different demographics in the area so do you think that we need additional safety signage there? Uh, through you Mr Mayor as Councillor Councillor Lansbury points out, I think the multilingual signage is one area of improvement along that um, along that area. So we have been working on the department on, on specific wording once they actually commence that investigative work. So the only improvement that I'd be suggesting at the moment is that multilingual signage. Yep. 
Any further questions, Councillor Lansford? Nope. Councillor Simons. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I support any initiatives that will strengthen the safety of our community. Uh, I've had a, a numerous residents contact me and express their concerns about the closure um, of the amazing adventure playground and ask me when it will reopen. And it's been really hard relaying the news that it won't reopen and that it will be split up into three playgrounds within the Hurstville Precinct. Um, at least that, that they can have community feedback and give their um, views on the concept designs. But what I find incredibly frustrating is knowing that the subsidence and contaminated, contamination issues were not treated as a priority previously by the former coalition government. And our, cons our council officers were constantly met with a combative attitude by the department. Council officers wanted to be proactive and address the escalating issues. However, meaningful discussions did not happen. There was no care or consideration given to the thousands of residents who utilise Kent Field, bearing in mind that Hurstville Ward has minimal open green space. At the very least, I believe we've lost two years where a remediation program could have been developed and now really been underway. Um, it was only after the election of a men's Labor government that we actually got action, and I thank goodness for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Symington. Uh, councillors, any further discussion on the motion? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Next item is what a splash play pad in the Georges River L LGA. Councillor Amber Hay-Bahar. Moved by Councillor Amber Hay-Bahar, seconded by Councillor Konyarski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll just briefly speak about the motion. So this motion was put forward um, as a re result of a number of local parents that have requested to explore the option of a splash play pad. So obviously there are numerous benefits for our community if we do consider looking at having one in the LGA, and I'll run through a couple of them. So number one, safe water play. So splash pads typically feature a non-slip surface and shallow water, providing a safe environment for children and families to enjoy water play without the risks associated with traditional pools. Uh, number two, inclusive recreation splash pads are accessible to people of all ages and abilities, including individuals with disabilities who may have difficulty in navigating the traditional um, water features. So they promote um, inclusive play and social interaction. And number three, health and fitness. Engaging in a water play encourages physical activity and helps promote healthy lifestyles. Children can run, jump and play while staying cool and active during hot weather. Number four, cooling effects. Splash pads offer relief from heat during hot summer days, serving as a refreshing escape for individuals and families seeking relief from high temperatures. Number five, community gathering space. So Splash pads often serve as a focal uh, point for community gatherings, providing opportunities for families and neighbours to come together, socialise and build connections. And finally, number six, customisation and creativity. So on that point, splash pads can be designed with various themes, features, interactive elements, allowing for creative and engaging experiences tailored to our preferences and interests of our community. So um, overall, these splash pads will offer uh, versatility and inclusive recreation options that promotes physical activity, social interactions and community engagement while providing a safe, refreshing way to beat the heat. And I guess I ask councillors tonight to support this motion as a step uh, towards exploring this option and a potential asset for the LGA, uh, given that we have a future of increase, increased density in our community, hotter summers and smaller backyards. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Amber Hagbaha. Um, councillors, any further discussion on the motion? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Next motion is New South Wales Government Active Kid and Creative Kids Vouchers, Councillor Lou. Moved by Councillor Lou, seconded by Councillor Kanyarski. Uh, Councillor Lou. Oh, thank you, Mr. May. Uh, so the purpose of this motion is coming from, I think it's from the, uh, uh, the request from the local community, a general community. So that's why I wanted to put a one 
A and B uh, into my motion that a council advocates for New South Wales uh, government to restate the original value and uh, eligibility criteria of the New South Wales active keys and creative keys vouchers by writing to the Minister for Customer Services and Digital Government. And B, the council notes the council's response to the New South Wales Active and Creative Kids Voucher Program will be considered as part of the Dodgers River Advocacy uh, Impact Plan development. Um, we all know that um, um, recognizing increasing cost of living pressure for families, especially um, when I really close and get involved in uh, the sports. Um, community and organizations and people from the parents from those families uh, they really um, some of them most of them heavily rely on those um, values um, for the vouchers value to really keep their need uh, kids um, active in the sports and um, creative uh, program as well so we wanted to see under the, the uh, current of living pressure for family we really want to see that uh, this could restay uh, for these uh, two uh, different kind of um, voucher back to uh, the normal um, uh, status. So help those families uh, really um, keep on going on the on this uh, active uh, program. Um, the other, additionally, the city future team in our council is uh, currently developing an advocacy impact plan. So hopefully this one could be uh, considered part of it. So a really, uh, really looking forward to other councillors could report could support this uh, uh, motion when you look at the, the details in the in the report it um, uh, put the um, um, different eligibility and the value uh, to explain why this um, where is uh, this motion is coming from so that's all for my details thank you mr may thank you councillor Lou councillor Simington. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm talking against this motion. I can't support it. It's Groundhog Day for me. The New South Wales Opposition 2023 Strategy Revisited. Last year in the New South Wales Legislative Assembly, I witnessed 13 general business notices of motion delivered in relation to this same topic, one being debated along with five public interest debates, all with the same theme. None were successful. Is Georgia's River Council now going to be the dumping ground for failed New South Wales opposition motions and strategies based on misinformation? I hope not, as our community deserves better. These are the actual facts. The Active Kids and Creative Kids program was not, not, not funded by the coalition government beyond the 30th of June 2023. The cost of $200 million was not in its 2022-23 budget or in any forward estimates. I actually listened, listened from June to November of hearing members of the government talk glowingly about their wonderful budget. Not one time do I hear them say, but Active Kids isn't in there. They just talk glowingly about it. Number two, the Mint's government introduced a more sustainable program estimated to cost $28 million that will be permanently means tested. So low and middle income families all have access. That's around 600,000 school aged kids. The Mint's government was, was left with a $7 billion of unfunded programs beyond active kids, which included 1,000 unfunded public hospital nurses, out-of-home care for vulnerable children, and cyber security, to name just a few. Ter the Treasurer, Daniel Milkey, has stated that this state finds itself in a serious and adverse situation due to the former coalition government handing over the largest debt in the state's history, with our state on track for a record 187.5 billion Sorry, just, debt. What is that supposed to do? It's about funding. It's funding. It goes to funding. It goes to funding. I'm sure that the Minister may write goes back to, to us. funding. Uh, Councillor Symington. Okay. I ask this question. How are the Coalition, if elected, going to fund these programs, which included Active Kids and Creative Kids vouchers, if they weren't in the budget? Where was the $700 million coming from? Would it have been privatisation? Maybe the former government had plans to sell other public assets. Would they have sold off Sydney Water or Hunter Water to name I think just now, a few? Councillor Symington, you're, you're, you're skirting on the boundary of where this motion I'm is going. I'm nearly, I'm nearly finished. I understand I'm nearly the finished. point. I think you're closing your nearly statement. Finished. I'm nearly finished. 
which in the first 100 days of the Men's Labor government were placed into our constitution to protect them for generations to come and ensure public ownership. In March 2023, the people of New South Wales overwhelmingly voted against privatisation when they elected the Men's Labor government. The privatisation of public assets that remain has stopped and responsible economic management has arrived. Thank you, Councillor Symington. I enjoyed the platform for the government there. Um, uh, councillors, uh, we had one speaker for, one speaker against. Uh, I can take another speaker for. Um, if there isn't one, I can take Councillor Lansbury. Are you speaking against? Sorry, I didn't ask you. I, you are. Yeah, Councillor Lansbury, speaker against. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I am <laughs> speaking against this motion um, for all of the same reasons that were highlighted by Councillor Symington. Um, this program was not funded beyond um, July or June or July 2023. So the incoming government, the incoming Labor government inherited this program along with $7 billion of unfunded programs as Councillor Symington mentioned. And she is correct, Councillor Kondowski. New South Wales Treasurer Daniel Mookie did say uh, with his budget document that the largest debt of any incoming state government has ever inherited as he handed down the party's first budget in more than a decade. At the change of government in March, the New South Wales government was facing gross debt of $188.2 billion by June 2026. And in the 15 months before March 23, when the election was held, 27.7 billion billion of new policy measures were added to the budget. Gross debt rose by $94 billion from June 2019 to June 2023. So that's $94 billion. These sorts of programs are nice to have and it hasn't been discontinued. It's just been moderated and means tested, which is a far more appropriate way for it to be managed going into the future. Um, the men's uh, late Labor government has now got to focus on housing, health, education, and essential services. You can't, there's, there's not enough money in the pot for everything. The Active Kids program is going to continue in a slightly, slightly reduced form, but there are very many competing demands in government that the current government is now trying to address. So I don't support this motion, and I would encourage other councillors to consider that view too. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Lansbury. Excuse me. Um, councillors, any further discussion on the motion? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All, all those against? No, I take the motion lost, uh, councillors. Uh, moving on to the next uh, motion, NM003-24, New South Wales Government Active Kids Vouchers uh, was done, was dealt with. Next item is sure. Next motion is NM005-24, Acknowledgement and Appreciation of Can Revive. Councillor, sorry, Local Street 004, sorry, thank you, Councillor Kanyaski, 004-24, Local Street Activation, uh, moved by Councillor Lou, seconded by Councillor Konyaski. Councillor Lou, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, we already listened to um, Tony representing the St. George of Eastern Chamber, uh, representing the, the local business community to support this one. So I think everyone knows where this one coming from, but I still wanted to um, to emphasize this a few four points. And, I'm, and I also know that I'm going to do a uh, amendment that uh, I think uh, Vicky already got the, the detail to put the E into the paper. So if I can read out 
all of those uh, five points. The first one, the council explore enhancing street appeal and improve uh, shop front, drawing inspiration from successful programs such as the shop front improvement uh, program 2023 to 2024. The Bowman Council will try to learn from others. They may include uh, uh, reinstating the big wash program to deliver uh, clear a uh, street. And the second, that council encouraged outdoor dining in designated area and times, therefore, by promoting local business and creating vibrant community spaces. And the third one would be that council prepare and submit a grant application for the transport for New South Wales vibrant street packages to deliver street uh, activations to support the local nighttime economy. And and the fourth one, that council explore new initiatives to enhance uh, street appeal, uh, drive local activations, and um, explain the nighttime economy in the next uh, iteration of the Georgia River economy development um, uh, strategy. And the fourth, the council encourage businesses to invest in enhancing street appeal and improve uh, shop front. So that's all the details. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lu. Uh, Councillor Wang. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are you speaking against the motion or for the motion? For the motion and okay. uh, and uh, under the amendment. Okay, no worries. Um, given that you're speaking for the motion, I'll just ask the seconder if uh, you're. Did you want to say a few words at all, Councillor Kanyaski, as the seconder? Oh, or sorry. sure, you reserve your right. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Wang, you've okay, got the floor. Thank you. Yeah, I support uh, Councillor Lu's motion to enhance the street appeal and improve the short run uh, wholeheartedly. And I also support initiatives to encourage outdoor, outdoor dialing and land economy because I have spoken to a lot to the shop owners in Hurstville about the, the general business environment in Hurstville. The street appeal comes up a lot and uh, any support of course from the local government from the state are most welcome i love so they also understand that the funding is limited and that the scope could be limited as well i got a strong sign sense and a desire from the local businesses that they are willing to put in to invest in the improvement of the street of here and the shop front out of their own pocket However, this cannot be done without the, you know, the encouragement and coordination from the council. So that's why I'm putting a, a, a amendment uh, just to, to spare out for the council to encourage the business to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wang. So Councillor Wang is proposing a amendment uh, to the motion. I'll put that forward to the mover and the seconder. Do you accept that, Councillor Lu? Yeah, I will accept that. And the only thing I wanted to see, yeah, we wanted to encourage the local business to invest, put the, uh, actually getting the money out of their pocket. So I don't want it to put a big pressure because at, at the current time, the, living, uh, the cost of living is so high. So we really wanted to keep that good balance, even though we wanted to invest. If That's why we wanted to council to apply for the state uh, funding if we if it's successful to so really can uh, release the pressure from the rate payers from in our local LGA. So that's um, the only thing I want to emphasize. Thank you. Councillor, can you ask you the second that you're happy with that amendment? Yes, Mr. Merrill. Yeah. So that now becomes the motion. motion. Councillor and behave how with the question. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, and to the respected director, um, I'm trying to understand. Uh, the motion about what we mean by council encouraging and exploring. Are we able to just sort of, I don't know, flesh that out a little bit so I understand what's being asked? Uh, we will call down Simon Macy, our manager for City Futures and Innovation. Thank you, Simon. Uh, through, through you, Mr. Mayor, so the councillor. Uh, we're still finalising what the application for the grant would look like and the intent for the grant would be around the, the matters that are included there around street appeal, street activation. So when we received the information about the grant recently, so we're still in the process of finalising that application. Councillor Any further questions? 
No, nothing. Thank you, Mr. Macy. Uh, Councillor Marnie. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just a question. Are we talking about the um, Hearst Fawn Cox CBDs or all the local centres too? Thanks. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Uh, yes, so the, the grant's available for the entire LGA, so we're still focusing uh, with that application where that location would be. Thank you. Any further questions? There being none, can I put the motion now? Uh, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Next item is acknowledgement and appreciation of Canada by Councillor Lou. Moved by Councillor Lou, seconded by Seconded by Councillor Catrus. Um, Councillor Lou. Sorry, sorry, Councillor Catrus. Yep, thank you. Councillor Lou. Uh, thank you. It? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think we all listened to the um, uh, the current president, uh, Eric Young's speech. Uh, um, in actually, he put something in writing. Uh, been uh, read out from our staff. Uh, we know that uh, they have been operating their Hurstville branch in, at the number eight park row. Uh, Hurstville is really in the center of Hurstville CBD, operating that uh, um, local branch for 16 years. Their purpose is trying to, uh, you know, to help help the families with uh, cancer patients and their family carers um, to encourage them get into um, into the circle and into the loop uh, with the similar situation so they can encourage them, um, you know, support each other. So their slogan I remember is that uh, you won't be alone um, when you you, you don't have to be alone when you're facing cancer. So really it's a really um, um, very active uh, local organizations in our community. So uh, that's why I put this uh, motion into it. So thank you for their serving the local community for 16 years. So we're looking forward, try, looking forward to any help that we can be, um, you know, council already there sponsors to sponsor there a lot of activities and the local business community and the broader business community from Chinese background um, try to help them as well. So that's why I wanted to appreciate, uh, you know, Karen Wye uh, being our local community organization. Thank you, Mr. May. Thank you, Councillor Lou. Uh, Councillor Catrus, do you have any further comments? No. Um, on, on that point, uh, I must uh, also note that uh, Can Revive was a successful applicant for Council's grant programs most recently, um, and they do amazing work within the community, so credit to them. Uh, it goes without saying. Um, councillors, I'll put the motion now. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. The next motion is NM006-24, significant success of Council's native stingless beekeeping workshop, workshop moved by Councillor Catrus, seconded by Councillor Fakara. Councillor Catrus, the floor is here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will move my motion as read, as it appears in business papers, and I reinforce our thanks to the Council officers that work with the Billion Bees Foundation in order to deliver an informative and very successful native stingless beekeeping workshop held on the 2nd of December 2023. A further thanks goes to the Honourable Linda Burney, MP, Minister for Indigenous Australians, who assisted in moving the program forward. Councillors, when I first heard of the Stingless Bee Foundation and their program, I was somewhat sceptical about, about bees being categorised as stingless. My only experience with bees was when I was very young, and what I quickly found out was that they sting, they all sting and it hurts. Um, I was, however, proven wrong. There is a variety of stingless bees that has been common knowledge to our traditional owners and custodians of the land on which uh, this meeting is being held. I attended the workshop among, amongst around about 50 other uh, community members, and I was amazed by what I learned about the beekeeping, about beekeeping and the structure of producing honey. Uh, that structure has evolved over many thousands of years uh, within bee colonies and hives. 
there appears to be a very distinct division of labor within the beehives. And it starts from the worker bees to the drones and to the queen bee. What also amazed me, and I think it's pretty interesting, what also amazed me was that they all had to use by date. And that when this came up for any particular bee, including the queen bee, the worker bees would ensure uh, that the relevant bee would be ostracized, kicked out of the hive, um, and because they, used, they did not serve any other useful purpose. Some of us can relate to that. The internal politics of beehives, the internal politics of beehives was somewhat interesting, but this not take away from the very positive significance of beekeeping in many areas, such as uh, the positive effect on the ecosystem, our reconnection to country and tradition, and maintaining cultural heritage alive and thriving, and also to the possible development of economic opportunities and other and other forms of development. Councillors, this new environmental and economic initiative originated from the practices of our Indigenous community who were consulted by the Billion uh, Bees Foundation, whose program was founded by the Black Summer Recovery Grants Program, which was all acknowledged and supported by our council executive and officers, and for which we are all thankful, and I therefore commend my motion to you. Thank you, Councillor Catrus. Any further discussion on the, on the motion? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Next motion is NM007-24, Master Plan for Cogra Strategic Centre. Deputy Mayor Ball. Moved by Deputy Mayor Ball. Seconded That's by Councillor Lansbury, I think it is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just um, I moved the motion as written in the report, and I just would like to start with a question to the Director of Planning, if I could, um, first, before speaking to the motion. Um, so, to the Director, through you, a resident has contacted me um, suggesting that as the Cogra Transport Oriented Oriented Development, the TOD, will capture the western side of Cogra, which is part of Bayside, and that Georges River Council should work with Bayside Council to develop a master plan for the entire area surrounding Cogra Railway Station. And I just would like if the Director could please provide a response to this suggestion. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Borg. Uh, look, it is more, it's very complex when you do a um, as something that cross council's areas. One, it relates to funding. Two, it relates to decision making. Three, it relates to what type of controls that we might be exploring. So my suggestion to council is that we look at a master plan only for the Cogra Town Centre. But as part of preparing that master plan, we do ongoing extensive consultation through the whole process, each stage of the process with Bayside. Um, I'll give you an example that when we were looking at the planning proposal for over the station, Bayside came along the journey with us. They were with the design workshops. They were there when we did, we had a briefing to the local planning panel. They were there when we were trying to develop appropriate controls. So we would ensure that the Bayside staff are with us on that journey through the development of, of the plan, but I wouldn't suggest we go into a joint master plan process. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um to the director. So just a couple of comments. So just in light of the announcement that Cogra is one of the centres included in the, the Todd program, it is more important than ever that Georges River Council gets on the front foot and creates a master plan for Cogra as a strategic centre. We've seen what's happened in Cogra North when the rezoning for high density living takes place without provisions to provide more open space and parking. Many of the areas that have potential to be converted into new open spaces in Cogra and even in Cogra North are state-owned land, such as the TAFE site in Montgomery Street and the Cogra High School Oval in Gladstone Street. Imagine the TAFE site converted into an open green space with car parking provided underneath. It would provide hospital staff and other workers somewhere to sit under a tree during their lunch break. It would provide somewhere for people to wait for their loved ones who may be having operations at, nearby, at a nearby hospital. 
Georgia's River Council can't do this alone and we have a unique opportunity now to work in collaboration with the state government and the Premier to deliver the objectives of the Todd set and at the same time create cooling green spaces in Cogra and provide more parking capacity um, and this is our opportunity to bring Cogra alive as a strategic centre. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lansbury. Thanks, Mr Mayor, and I am going to ask your indulgence to allow Councillor Catchers to have something to say on this because I know that Cogra is very dear to his heart. But I just wanted to um, just make some comments on basically the fact that uh, Council Borg has included the TAFE car park in this um, and the master plan was included in that motion that we dealt with at, or the request for a master plan funding for the master plan was the motion that we dealt with a couple of weeks ago at the extraordinary meeting. Um, just wanted to make the comment that I think is one of those, if not now, when moments with the TAFE car park. I've been on council for 20 years next month and ever since I've been on council, there's been discussions about redeveloping that site. And every time you drive past it on a really busy day and it's half full and there are people driving around and around the block, it just does my head in. It's really timely that something is done with that. And always these things get back to money and who's going to pay for it. Um, you know, there, there are options that could be considered. It'd be great if, if it was either an underground car park or perhaps a multi-storey car park, but it just needs to cater for the volume of traffic that is all current, currently use, utilising that location and what will happen if there's some of that development does go ahead, even though our controls are actually a little bit more than what the Todd would, would provide. But I think it's a really timely uh, point in time, not very well phrased, to put the TAFE car park back on the agenda, given the fact that we will be looking at increased density. It's not Cobra North has done all that heavy lifting. It's got to move elsewhere. But for that particular section, it's incredibly busy. You've got the TAFE, sure. You've got the medical precinct and many other businesses that people need to access. Not everybody is going to get a spot in the Derby Street car park. Not everyone's going to get a spot on the street. Um, I happen to spend a lot of time, three times a week, driving around and around and around, trying to find a place to park before I go to the gym there. So I know what it's like from personal experience at all different times of day. There just isn't enough parking in Cogra. And if we are going to be increasing density continually, that needs to be addressed. That to me is a real no brainer. So thank you, Councillor Ball, for putting this before us tonight. Thank you, Councillor Lansbury. Any speakers against it? There being none, uh, Councillor Catrasol. Yes, thank you for indulging me. I do appreciate Councillor Lansbury um, uh, uh, paying me the respect of um, actually. Oh, we all know that you're very passionate about that. that. Councillors, look, I, call, I do commend Councillor Borg for her motion and I wholeheartedly support it. With regards to the first part that deals with yeah, initiating discussions with the Premier, the Honourable Chris Mins, in order to develop a master plan for the Congress Strategic Centre and also create a vision for uh, greening the CVD. I am in total support, but this master plan must acknowledge that any purchases of land in the CVD entail a huge expenditure. And it is inappropriate, inappropriate to take away street car parking space so that we can establish small patches of green space. This has been done all the time and that's not going to be the answer. Uh, I appreciate the concept that uh, Council Book has indicated underground car parking and green space on top of it, um, but there are many, many options that should be considered. Uh, the plan must become more creative. For many years I've been lobbying and calling for an approach which results in the construction of open public recreational green space over the railway line, just past Cogra Station, which should be done in collaboration, as Councillor Bork indicated, with Bayside Council. Many residential apartments have been constructed in Cogra North and many millions of dollars of, um, uh, have been collected in the form of Section 711 and 712 developer contributions, building over such infrastructure is not new. And uh, it does not, how can I put it, um, it's not a horrendous pro proposition to build building over a, a railway station. People seem to think you build over a railway station, vibration, blah, 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 and all sorts of structures. Our developers have been building open public recreational 
uh, spaces on top of their buildings 30 stories high. So they can do it with just a simple slack, some columns, and anti-vibration uh, initiatives. We can do it too. Let's just, and I think that's really important for us. Um, token gestures uh, to greeting our CBD by little patches everywhere are meaningless. Just do the whole hog, go the whole hog. With regards to the second part of Council of Board's motion, once again, I'm in total support in increasing the car parking capacity of the TAFE car park in Montgomery Street, uh, Cobra. This TAFE car park is really the only area left within the whole of the Cobra CBD where we can hope to do something that may alleviate some of the car parking uh, issues that face those that visit Cobra Commercial, the Cobra Pier. This was acknowledged by our Labor candidate for the state seat of Cobra, who is now the Premier of the state, said the Honourable Chris Mintz. I'll read you an article which appeared just quickly. I'll read you an article which appeared um, in the front page of the leader, updated the 16th, uh, the 16th of October 2000. Uh, 14, that was 2014. Cogra Car Park hopes rise as, and as Councillor uh, Lansbury indicated, it's been going on for thousands of years. Um, Cogra Car Park hopes rise as Labor moves on TAFE site conversion. Uh, Cogra CBD car parking shortage would be great news under a Labor Party state pre election promise to create an extra 450. Uh, short stay spaces. The Labor candidate for Cogra, Chris Mint, announced the plan with, uh, I'll be finished in about half a minute, announced the plan with Cog uh, Cogra Council Nick Cattie, who said it was envisioned the car park would have seven levels, including a basement, um, and there would be 500, 550 car, car spaces all up, of which 90 uh, 90 on one level would be allocated to the Tate College, etc., etc. 450 spaces would be provided. The planning, uh, Chris Mintz at the time said that the chronic lack of parking within the Cogra CBD is leading to a significant loss of trade for local businesses. And last year, the council collected 1.3 million. Council Catra said parking has been a problem in Cogra for as long as he could remember. The standard response from the council is that there is no land to build car, a park up in the CBD. He said using the safe site overcomes the obstacle and it does overcome the obstacle councillors. I think it's the most important issue. I congratulate Councillor Bull for putting it together. Councillor Lansbury does remember all the rigmarole that went on of trying to do something in the tape car park. You just have to kill the bureaucracy and get it done. Thank you, Councillor Catrus. Uh, Councillors, any further discussion on the matter? There being none, uh, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I'll declare that carried. The next motion is NM008-24, Vanessa Street Beautification Improvement Program. Uh, Councillor Symington, moved by Councillor Symington, seconded by Councillor Wang. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Ms McKinley has... Um, a slight amendment to the motion. Um, it will read now that Council explores solutions to enhance the beautification of Vanessa Street in Beverly Hills and Kings Grove and improves ongoing maintenance and upkeep in these areas. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Um, Councillors, Vanessa Street has been impacted by several factors in recent years that have contributed to it. I'm looking particularly sparse and unattractive. Resident Stephen Carlisle, who has persistently championed the beautification, describes parts as looking like a bare mining site. Um, the existing uh, garden beds have been damaged by the illegal dumping of mattresses, furniture, building refuse, um, you name it, they dump it. Um, it's like People think they have a carte blanche to um, use it as a free dumping site. This has been compounded by the parking of heavy vehicles on the dirt surfaces, which has led to more dumping and damaging occurring. Hopefully, with the new uh, the sandstone block installation, it will prevent heavy vehicles parking in the car-only bays and the associated damage um, to the surrounds or seats. It may also be time for council officers to consider camera surveillance installation to identify trucks that attempt to damage the sandstone blocks 
as as has previously happened, and that's why new sandstone blocks are being put in place. And I think that'll actually save the council money. I think it's also worthwhile considering asphalting the parking bays to prevent the continual soil runoff, erosion, potholes, deep puddles, and the dirt um, running into the gutters and blocking them. Um, this would also be a more permanent solution and again, reduce maintenance costs. In the meantime, the planting of shallow rooted um, plants, mulching, regular maintenance and weed spraying should assist in making this area look less barren. And because as a local resident, you want to feel pride when you move around your community, especially if you live close by. I look forward to seeing the results. Thank you, Councillor Symington. Uh, Councillor Wayne. Oh, yeah, I, I just support uh, uh, Councillor Simonton's motion. Uh, personally, I have been there many times. It's a it's a real real eyesore for for Beverly Hills, especially you know. Otherwise, Beverly Hills that part is a, a beautiful place, and um, and uh, thanks to also to Stephen for putting very comprehensive suggestions and working close with the council. So yeah, hopefully we can get get a move on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wang. Uh, any further discussion, councillors? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. The next motion is NM009-24. Congratulations to the San Suzy Sea Devil Swim Club. Uh, Deputy Mayor Borg, thank you. Moved by Deputy Mayor Borg, uh, seconded by Councillor Lou. Deputy Mayor Borg, thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, I'll move the motion as written in the report. Um, I'd like to congratulate the San Susie Sea Devils for once again putting on a fabulous summer swim carnival at San Susie Leisure Centre. Uh, I was unable to attend on the day, so I want to thank Councillor Moore, who did attend to show council support, along with Councillor Catrice, who I understand has nominated the club to receive funding to support the swim carnival from his uh, council discretionary board fund. Uh, the club has provided me with some highlights from the carnival, which I'd like to share with you tonight. Um, there were 335 swimmers registered from 24 clubs that participated in the carnival. Uh, San Suzy Sea Devils had 91 of their 120 members compete, meaning 76% of the club participated. The Sea Devils swimmers achieved their own personal best times in 165 of the 306, just over half of all the races they competed in, which is a fantastic achievement. Um, a total of 41 summer carnival records were broken across the meet, eight of which were achieved by San Suzy Sea Devils swimmers, who I'd like to just make a spe special mention of here. Max Piper broke the boys' eight years 53 and 50 back. Amelia O'Brien broke the girls' 15 and over 100 fly, 50 fly and 100 free. Hayley Unwin broke the girls' 15 and over 50 breast. Uh, Jamie Jeffrey broke the girls' 14, and 14 years um, 100 back. And Sienna Marsic broke the girls' 14 years 50 back. Uh, the club expressed me their thanks for the support um, provided to them by Georges River Council's events team, um, who provided Georges River Council gazebos to help um, shade, provide shade for their swimmers, their volunteers and officials in the marshalling area. Um, and a special shout out to all of the sponsors of this event and also to the volunteer technical officials from METC, the governing body for swim clubs in the metro southeast of Sydney, who enabled this to be an official swim meet. I know that Mark Smith, the president of METC and a member of Council's Sports Advisory Committee, was leading the army of technical officials volunteering on the day. Uh, so, councils, I hope you can support me in congratulating the committee, the parents and the volunteers from the Sea Devils. Um, these events take a huge amount of planning and organisation, which is all done by volunteers, so local kids um, have the opportunity to participate and compete. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Borg. Uh, Councillor Lou. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, there's a seconder. Sorry, do you have any comments, Councillor Lou? Did you want to say anything, or can um, I pass yeah, it over to Councillor? Very, Patrice? very simple. Just yeah, try to support the deputy mayor's motion. Yeah, as far as I know, since the last December, before Christmas and New Year season, uh, their coaching team been uh, uh, refreshed. We, under the leadership of Alex and Halina, we can see it really progressing. So, I was really happy to to see that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Lou. Councillor Catrice. Just a quick comment. Um, yes, um, I do totally agree with Councillor Borg's congratulations to this, um, to the, for the uh, successful carnival. I do want to say one thing. I did have a whole lot of statistics that Councillor Borg has already quoted, so I'm not going to repeat those. Um, I was really amazed to see how many 
uh, parent, I mean, Councillor Mort was there, and we all got so many photographs done. But what we really have, and I also got three medals, gold, bronze, and silver, but without even swimming. So anyway, um, the what I really want to say within just one as one paragraph is that I was amazed at the number of parents and volunteers that were there on, uh, on a voluntary basis, not being paid, encouraging their children to, to, to get themselves involved in um, what you call outdoor sports. It was a wonderful thing to see. And as Councillor Borg said, it indicated there were roughly about 300 plus or 320 uh, people there, kids, kids there. I just, I was just amazed that all of a sudden there's a resurgence of outdoor sports and getting them off their iPads and the, uh, computers for rather uh, and, and doing things, uh, doing, doing outdoor stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Capius. Uh, Councillors, any further discussion on the motion? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. The next motion is NM010-24, Camping and Caravanning in the LGA. Moved by Councillor Catrus, seconded by Deputy Mayor Bork. Yeah, I, look, I don't, I mean, I think it says it all in the directory report. I don't need to say anything unless someone's objecting to the motion. Uh, is there any objection to the motion? There being none, I'll put the motion. Okay. All those in, oh, sorry, Councillor Murray. Sorry, Mr Mayor, I did just have a question on that agenda item. Question. Um, yeah, through you, Mr Mayor, to the Director of Community and Culture. Um, in the report that you're preparing on homelessness in the LGA, uh, subsequent to Councillor Amby Haberhar's motion of last year, will you be addressing the issue of campus in parks who may be homeless? Thank you. Through you, Mr Mayor, we can do that. The research is getting um, undertaken at the moment, so we can include that if Council would like. Thank you. Any further questions, councillors? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. The next motion is NM011-24. Source separation of return and earn eligible containers at public place litter bins. Moved by Councillor Marnie, seconded by Councillor Lansbury. Councillor Marnie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we all know the benefits of the return and end scheme, which not only keeps containers out of the waste stream, but rewards those individuals who cash them in. A shining example of this is, our, is one of our own residents, Mr Aaron Batson, who has collected over 35,000 of them and gives the proceeds to the Sydney Dogs and Cats Home and who was this year awarded the honour of Young Citizen of the Year. The concept of source separation is extremely simple. A white basket is attached to, to a public rubbish bin so that anyone can deposit the used return and earn container in it. Someone else will invariably collect the items and cash them in. The advantages of this is that containers are kept out of the waste stream, particularly general waste bins as all the refuse goes into landfill, reduced litter and it removes the safety hazard from people who might go searching for containers within the bins. The system has been implemented in several LGAs with some trials going on interstate as well as in Wollongong. And if this motion is approved, we could be one of the first, if not the first, council in Sydney to consider, consider such a trial. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Marnie. Uh, any further discussion on the motion? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Uh, next motion is NM012-24, Beverly Hills Commuter Car Park Hybrid Parking, uh, moved by Councillor Symington, seconded by Councillor Wang. Councillor Symington, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I move my motion as read. Uh, Councillors, Transport for New South Wales advised George's River Council in August 2022 that he, it had decided that the proposed Beverly Hills commuter car park would be made available to non-commuters. Um, at that time, Transport New South Wales told George's River Council that the non-commuters will have access by a fixed payment rate during peak commuter hours and a fee structure for the car park car park being made available for use by non-commuters during evenings and weekends is also going to be investigated. That was 18 months ago. And even though council officers have persistently tried to receive further information and more importantly, actual details, nothing has been forthcoming. I'm now um, worried that the silence means that a hybrid car park is all too difficult, um, as was the construction of actual accessible car park. 
We need clarity. Is the hybrid system still proceeding? As if so, what will the fee structure be? Because it needs to be fair and equitable for non-commuters. On the Transport for New South Wales Beverly Hills Commuter Car Park website, they state that Transport for New South Wales is committed to finding a solution that ensures the commuter car park is available for use by both commuters and non-commuters to support the local community and that they are currently investigating options for the car park to be available for non-commuters during off-peak hours, evening and weekends. We will draw from results of ongoing trials at at uh, Westride, Asheville and Cobra Park and Ride car parks. Construction is due to be completed at the end of 2024, so I don't think that it's unreasonable to have some answers now. Transport for New South Wales needs to share information with council officers, bearing in mind that the previously imposed clearways and the loss of the free Edgebuston car park have caused the loss of approximately 169 parking spaces, and the local business, business community has been severely impacted. And the local community needs future certainty and they need it now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Symington. Any further discussion? Uh, yeah, I just want to I just want to thank Councillor Symington for her persistent advocacy for the residents of Beverly Hills. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wang. Councillors, any further discussion? There being none opted the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I would declare that carried. Next motion is NM013-24. Congratulations on New South Wales State Title Awards. Councillor Mort, moved by Councillor Mort, seconded by Councillor Lou. Oh, Councillor Mort. Okay. Um, I just want to congratulate St George Athletic Club sprinter Jade Johnson Matreski for claiming her first state open title at the 10th annual Illawarra Track Challenge in Wollongong on Saturday the 13th of January 24. Um, Like you you councillors, um, I think it's important that we recognise the exceptional performances by individual groups and teams in our LGA. Um, I'd like to recognise the outstanding young sprinter from the mighty St George Athletic Club, which turned 100 years last year, who recently achieved a very noteworthy result. Jay Johnson Petreski at the hotly contested Illawarra Track Challenge on January 13 broke the St George Open Women's Record in 11.67 seconds, coming third from 94 competitors. The reason for tonight's recognition is that Jay started in little A's with the club and as such a truly homegrown product, who no doubt has bigger things in store for her in the world of athletics. You are all aware of the long and glorious history of St George Athletics. Like I say, 100 years, it celebrated that 100 years last year. And Jade is another example of what it can offer our local sporting community. The work and incredible discipline that Jade has demonstrated over the last six months to steadily bring her times down, running three PBs in that period is a credit to her and the tremendous work of this great club. So please support my motion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mort. Uh, any further discussion on the motion? Councillor Luke. Sorry, Nat. Uh, okay. Councillor Mort, yeah, Bishop, Mike. Councillor Luke. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, listen to the um, the motions. Uh, firstly, really strong support the motion. And secondly, um, we can see. 100, 100 years um, milestone for this uh, organization. And um, not only the organization and the athlete, I think they are well deserve to be recognized because behind the scene, uh, we know how much uh, um, commitment and how many hours that they put into uh, their sports um, activities to achieve the current uh, uh, you know, goal. So. Thank you for uh, Councillor Wall's motion to recognise the achievement. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lou. Any further discussions, councillors? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Next motion is NM014-24, Review of Safety and Security Measures at Hurstville Aquatic Leisure Centre. Moved by Councillor Wang, seconded by Councillor Symington. Councillor Wang. 
thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I raised uh, this motion with a, a very heavy heart, as you have heard from the two public speakers early on. And uh, I thank them, Mr. Sheng and Ms. Chen, for their courage to speak out against the, the recent crime at Hurstville Aquatic and Leisure Center. I just want them to know um, they are not alone in this endeavor. And uh, actually, uh, three of us uh, paid a visit to the center only yesterday. And we have received overwhelming support from the patrons and uh, collected uh, uh, 37 petition signatures just within 30 minutes and more on the way. I want to specifically acknowledge Mr. Shen, who is not only a friend of mine, but also a cancer patient for whom swimming is a part of his uh, treatment plan. The trauma, the trauma he and his family experienced because of this crime is deeply troubling. Imagine the shock of finding your belongings missing, including your car after visiting to the center. <laughs> Uh, no one should have, uh, uh, no one should have to induce such a distressing experiences. Since the step occurred, I have been actively involved in following up on the case. I have personally reached out to our superintendent, Rohan Kramsey, commander of the St. George Police Area Command, on two occasions, and I have exchanged multiple emails to assist in resolving the matter. So additionally, I, I sought the assistance from the office of a local member, the Cobra, Premier Chris Minx, who kindly uh, notified the Minister for Police of New South Wales. I have also discussed this issue with uh, the Mayor and the uh, Director, Mr. Latter, both of whom have been provided their full support. Thank you. Despite all these efforts and the diligent work, of the police. The thieves remain at large and the criminal investigation is ongoing. Re regrettably, this incident is not isolated. Another resident shared a similar experience of losing his car and belongings in the centers and the cover car park. With the case remaining unsolved and the dumped car was found only a month later. It appears to me that they may be a serial offenders exploring security vulnerabilities in the center. It is evident that the improvements are needed to enhance security measures at the center, implementing a truly functional CCTV system with the prominent deterrence signs and establishing a robust process for ensuring safety and security should be a priority. This is the minimal expectation for a high traffic public place, particularly one as significant as our community harbor with over 1 million visits per year. I understand that the center has faced the huge challenges, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, but the business is now on a strong path to recovery. Safety and security should always remain paramount. And I urge my fellow councillors to support this motion to enable the council to collaborate with the Blue Fit and address this critical security concern at the centre. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wang. Any further discussion on the motion? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Next motion is NM015-24, cost shifting for Beach Watch Program Council. Moved by Councillor Marnie, seconded by Councillor Deputy Mayor Borg. Thank you, Mr Mayor. The Beach Watch Program plays a vital role in the health of our river and has done for 35 years. It gives a necessary indication to everyone who uses it for swimming, boating, fishing, or even walking or living in that vicinity that the water is either safe or otherwise. Unfortunately, the government is proposing to shift the cost of this onto councils, which is simply unfair as our rivers are wholly and solely within the jurisdiction of the state. 
In addition, the greatest threat to the water quality in our LGA is Sydney Water's ageing and overflowing North Jordanura submain, which is once again a government responsibility. In conclusion, as the shifting of another state government cost on the Georgia River Council from this July is difficult to justify, I'd appreciate your support of this motion. Um, Mr Mayor, I apologise. I should have mentioned earlier that um, I had a slight amendment to this sure. motion. Sure, Councillor Yep. Yeah, it's up on the screen now. So it, it mentions three sites um, being Cars Park, Oatley Bay and Jewfish Bay. So, yeah, the, the motion's amended. Is, is that... Is that okay with you? Uh, so long as it's fine with the mover and the seconder. Thank you. Yep. So that's uh, accepted. That now becomes the motion. Any further comments, Councillor Marnie? Any further discussions, Councillor Councillor Lansbury? Um, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I was just hoping if we could get the first that I knew of this was when I saw Councillor Marnie's motion on the business paper, and we had a bit of a chat about it today, and I believe it just sort of came in very late last year to Council. I'm just wondering if there's any other information that can be shared with us now as to what sort of cost would be imposed upon Council. Do we know that yet? Um, Mr General Manager, uh, or any of the directors? Probably need to take that on notice, um, okay. Council Lansbury, and that information will be shared with councillors. Yep, that would be uh, great. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, councillors, any further discussion? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. Next motion is NM016-24, proposed Ellen Subway raised pedestrian crossing. Uh, Councillor uh, Jamison, moved by Councillor Jamison, seconded by Councillor Amber Hay-Bahar. Councillor Jamison, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, if we could just put the motion up, so it's amended, so it's a lot more palatable for people, I think. Okay. Um, I'll, since it's already passed, I won't bother um, reading it. Um, okay, I should read the motion. Okay. Um, the motion is that Council proceed with the Ellen Subway and Cook Street Victoria Avenue pedestrian crossings as a matter of urgency to mitigate safety issues for pedestrians. And as part of the implementation of these works, that Council broadens the notification that Ellen Subway raised pedestrian crossing by riding to locally affected residents and businesses, notifying of the up upcoming works beyond those who have already been notified. Uh, I just wanted... Uh, oh, Council Jamison uh, is putting forward an amendment to that motion and presenting the motion up on the screen. I'll take that the seconder is happy with that. Uh, given that Councillor Andy Hay Pahar is the seconder is happy with that, uh, that now becomes the motion. <coughs> Councillor Jamison, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I just wanted to commend the Council for the work that has been done to this point on this project to improve pedestrian safety, including investigations of pedestrian and vehicle accounts and securing grant funding for this project. I appreciate that a normal traffic facility goes through a fairly standard consultation process after being endorsed by the Traffic Committee. However, the reason I've proposed this motion tonight is because I believe that the raised pedestrian traffic facility at Ellen Subway is situated in a highly important location that connects one side of Mortdale to the other. It affects a much broader Mortdale population than just those who's, those living in the immediate vicinity who may have received the standard notification. So it is for this reason that I believe the proposed work should have a more broader notification than just a standard traffic facility, which is what this motion calls for. There is no debate that pedestrian safety must be paramount, especially when this is a route frequented by hundreds of school kids leaving Morris Pences. And this motion certainly doesn't seek to delay the uh, construction of the pedestrian crossing, which I understand is not yet scheduled in. So therefore, there is no risk in extending the consultation or, or notification. I just want the broader community to become aware of the upcoming works and have an opportunity to improve pedestrian access. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jamison, and I know that you actually um, uh, rectified that it actually just broadening broad, the notification of the works that are intended, not extending the consultation. Uh, Councillor Amber Apaha is the second that you wish to make any comment. Councillor Catrice, are you speaking against the motion? A, you know, it's just a question that I have questions. with the Director. Thank you, Councillor um, Director Andrews. Um, Andrew Lennon. Um, your uh, your
process of consultation. Is that does that follow a standard format? And why? And if it does, what is it? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, we do have a standard format for consultation. The extent of consultation would um, depend on the nature of any improvement. So, if it was a large improvement, we'd try and we'd try and um, we would try and consult or, or advise more broadly. If it's a smaller sort of installation, then we would sort of narrow that consultation to only those that were directly impacted by it. So, the surrounding re residents directly impacted. Um, a follow-on question. You were uh, quite satisfied with what you proposed as a an area of consultation. I, I think that probably goes without saying, Councillor Catrus. Otherwise, it wouldn't be up before us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, would you are you continuing to follow your standard format in on all situations? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. O operationally, we do have a standard format in place for for notification once we have traffic facilities passed through the traffic committee and um, we'd continue to follow that moving forward um thank you thank you thank you yes i'm speaking against it speaking against it. yes i'll sure. be speaking against it thank you um there's a good reason behind this um uh, mr mayor i do actually want to thank all those councillors that got together and assisted in providing a more amicable let's say, uh, a more amicable um, uh, motion in this regards. And I'm quite happy with the fact that it's, um, it's, it's promoting the construction of that crossing. I had a whole speech against what was being proposed, but I, I still have an issue, a small issue, be it a small issue, the councillors have got together and assisted in this one for quite a substantial length of time um, did a good job but there is one element that still uh, that still worries me and that's the element of the fact that our council officers do a bloody good job a very good job in getting that message out to the community talking to the community about what the problems are answering their questions. I mean, we have very, very qualified council officers that do a good job. I cannot support... Sorry, Councillor Catcher, so I'm going to pull you up because motion in itself uh, is not questioning that process whatsoever. Um, no, like if you are wanting to go down that path, yeah. um, it would not actually be related to that, apart from the fact that that's ground, that's background work that already goes on. Well, this is speaking Mr. about the process moving forward. So, Mr. Mayor, the part that I'm concerned about is the second part, adding another layer of work for the council officers that have already done the work in a proper and professional manner. I do not believe that we should be adding more layers of work once the council officers have completed their work in a proper professional manner. Therefore, I will be voting against it. Thank you, Councillor oh, Catherine. Can I also foreshadow a motion? I will foreshadow that if this motion is defeated, I will be moving the first part with the deletion of the second part. Uh, there's a foreshadowed motion uh, being put forward. Foreshadowed motion will only be considered if the first motion fails. Uh, Councillor Fakara, are you speaking against the motion? Yes. Okay, Councillor Picaro, the motion floor is yours. Um, I, I just want to uh, share very quickly that I'm very supportive of the pedestrian crossing being put in at Ellen Subway. I think pedestrian safety is very important, especially when we're talking about children. Um, but I, I think we need to be incredibly consistent about the policies that we have. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Picaro. Uh, Councillors, any speakers for the motion? Councillor Amber Hay Park. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in respect of the amended motion, uh, motion put forward, I think it's really important to understand the first part that at no point um, has Councillor Jamison or myself in supporting this motion, we understand how important this pedestrian installation is for more. Um, Councillor Jamison also indicated in her um, uh, speech in respect to this motion is addressing some of the issues that Mortdown has, specifically around traffic. 
um, and that needs to be taken into consideration. But the most important part is about the notification. So besides the traditional processes that our council officers have gone through, I think um, given the importance of the locality of this particular intersection at Ellen Subway, I think it's important to get some feedback from the community who also live outside the scope that council officers would traditionally um, would notify. I think also what needs to be addressed here is notification provides an opportunity for um, those who would be impacted to provide some feedback that not necessarily changes the outcome of what's being proposed by the traffic committee and what, what we've already been successfully um, provided with the grant to actually install the pedestrian crossing at both at um, Cook, uh, sorry, Victoria Ave and also at Dillon Subway. Um, I think I hear what Councillor Catrice has indicated and also Councillor uh, Fakara, um, but I think the, the importance of this locality is, needs to be highlight, uh, highlighted to everyone who would traditionally not travel in that area. They have been impacted significantly with a lot of changes in the, ups, um, the, the upgrade within the on Morts Road. Um, and I think, you know, councillors tonight should take in consideration that this amended motion actually addresses, one, the importance of the installation, which I think we can all agree here today that no one uh, would be opposing that aspect. But having a broader notification is not changing the outcome necessarily. Um, and I think it's important that we should be addressing that because obviously councillor Jamison and I deal with the backlash. I'm not sure about councillor Smirtley about the implications about a lot of things being introduced into that particular vicinity and, um, you know, not getting that genuine feedback from the community. Thank you, councillor and behave uh, Councillors, any further discussion? There being none, look up. Uh, councillor Jamison, you get your right of reply. Thank you. Um, I'll just... Sorry, councillor and behave oh, sorry. If I could just have a question. So how much does this inconvenience the staff? Um, I, from my understanding, when we spoke with the director, it's just a matter of a letter. Is it going to, um, how much is it going to um, inconvenience the staff? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, as Councillor Jamison points out, it is a letter and we will be just um, dropping that off to a broader sort of catchment than was previously um, previously done. So it's not a massive inconvenience to, to staff. So uh, thank you. So with that in mind, if you take into consideration that um, we have people here that were asking questions, that they are going to be affected by it and they weren't aware of it until one of the residents actually posted it on Maltdale Village Community Facebook, I think it's fair to say that they feel that they need to be heard. Now, how much we can do, how much change, I'm not too sure, but I think it's just a courtesy that we answer their questions because as... So the, um, the chance, sorry, it wasn't very clear. So it's a chance to answer the questions, like we had the question of a truck. I don't know if, if there's any issues with that. Um, the, the traffic issues, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not a traffic expert, but I think it's fair enough to answer the questions and say, no, there's no issue with that. Um, you can feel uh, at peace with it. And as um, Councillor um, Amby Hart has actually said, and I said your name wrong, didn't I? Amby Hart. Hart um, I guess we do get the, back, uh, the backlash. We hear the community. We've heard them multiple times and all they're asking is that they just know about these things. Now, having said that, in a normal circumstance, it wouldn't be a big issue, but this is a one-lane bridge which does affect people. It connects. It's a very important, critical piece of, uh, I guess, roadway that connects two sides of Mortdale. And I think it's only fair that we go out and communicate it. It's not going to be convenient, inconveniencing anyone. Um, and, the, you know, the pedestrian access is important. Child safety is important. I have children. Um, you know, I was part of the Mordale PNC. Children are important. And I think it's important that we just give people that courtesy. Uh, given that, that that was the right of reply. It's going to depend. It's going to determine how I vote. Sure. Okay. Councillor Symington's got a question. Yeah, okay, my question is to the director. So it was said it's just a letter going out to the residents. Now in the letter, is it going to have like an email address so they can reply to a council officer or a phone? Are those are those council officers going to have to defend the the implementation of that traffic um, uh, crossing? 
Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, yeah, there will be contact details on the letter as there, as there normally are, um, and responses will be provided. Uh, usually in these circumstances, we do get common sort of themes coming through, so hopefully we don't get 340 views of, of what it is, but it, there's usually common themes coming through in these, so there will be contact details provided. Councillors, any further questions? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against? I'll take division. Uh, all those councillors in favour of the motion, please raise your hand. Oh, do you need names? Uh, Elmi, yes. Borg, yes. Stratocopolis, yes. Jamison, yes. MBH, uh, yes. Wang, yes. Lou, yes. Moore, yes. Lansbury, yes. Marnie, yes. Konyarski, yes. All those against? Catrus, no. Smoothly, no. Fakara, no. Symington, no. Motion is carried. Councillors, we move on to the Next motion, rectification works in Mordale shopping area. Councillor Jamison, uh, moved by Councillor Jamison, seconded by Councillor Amby Hay Park. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that there have been many unforeseen circumstances that have arisen in the Mortdale Streetscape Upgrade Project. The motion is calling for council to proactively contact affected business owners to identify issues so council's contractors can rectify them. As a Mortdale Ward Council, I frequently get contacted about this project, which was unfortunately taking longer than originally anticipated. People ask me about timing. That, oh, and most importantly, when it's going to be completed, etc. So as part of this motion, I'm calling for Council to keep the Mortdale Streetscape Upgrade webpage updated with the project status so this information can be shared with people querying the status and to share the link to this updated page in various locations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jamison. Any, no, any further discussion, Councillors? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. We'll take a five minute adjournment, councillors, um, and come back and finish off the rest of the motion and also the rest of the agenda. Thank you. We're dealing with NM018 24, Douglas Cross Gardens, repurposing of the fountain area. Uh, moved by Councillor Moore, seconded by. Councillor Lansbury. Councillor Moore, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, Fountains at Douglas Cross Gardens. The General Manager provided a report detailing the cost and feasibility of A, converting the disused Upper Fountain Pond and Railway co uh, Concourse to Bicycle Park and Garden Seat or a combination of these. And B, recommissioning or replacing the former fountain and lower pond. Uh, so I'll just speak to it. As councillors would be aware, Douglas Cross Gardens at Oakley Railway Station have been a standout for many years. They are beautiful, popular and well maintained. Thanks to the amazing skills of council gardeners who have cared for this area as well as Oakley Memorial Park for decades. However, as is often the case, the, general, the original design with cascading waters has not flowed for a long while, which is disappointing considering it adds so much to these exceptional gardens. In fact, this council still advertises the gardens for hire. Douglas Cross was a member for George's River from 1948 to 1970 and also served as an alderman on Cogler Municipal Council from 1942 to 1970 during which time he was mayor for two terms. He was also a member of Cumberland Council, of Cumberland and St George County Councils. The award-winning gardens were finished in 1969 and it was thanks to Mr Cross who donated $1,000 that the iconic fountain was installed. For decades, the gardens were used by scores of locals for weddings and photographic sessions. However, since the decommissioning of the fountain, the gardens have been used less 
for this purpose. Many community, community members have been calling for the fountain to be recommissioned, as we've heard from a couple of speakers here tonight. So this motion is to request the general manager provide a report detailing the cost to convert the di disused fountain the disused fountain pond under the railway concourse to bicycle parking, new garden or seating or a combination of them. And secondly, to recommission or repair the former fountain and the lower pond. Councillors, I am asking you to support this motion for a study. It will hopefully result in the recommissioning of the fountain in memory of Douglas Cross and return the gardens to their former glory, provide more income to council and open up the possibilities for bike parking, seating, or a new garden bed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mort. Councillor Wainsbury. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Mort, for bringing this to us. Um, I'm supporting this motion because I support recommissioning the fountain. I think that these sorts of features were um, quite common in the 60s and 70s, and it's a very iconic location. It's part of Oatley being known as the Garden Suburb, or was the former Cogra. So um, I think, as Councillor Mort mentioned, he, uh, Douglas Cross was a, a, an alderman, as they called them then, at Cogra, who also contributed his own funding to it. I don't think it's a coincidence that it's been decommissioned since 2020, and it, uh, the report indicates that it was uh, leaking and high water bills and things like that. But I also think it's worth remembering that that was when we we're in the height of the water restrictions around the bushfire season. A lot of those sorts of water features were turned off by local club. And I, I would imagine that was probably part of the reason that it was turned off then. Um, you know, I went to Blakehurst Primary School and on the highway there at the bottom of the steps was a fountain that was installed in, I think, all like the 60s or the 70s. And it was a really lovely water feature at that point. That was turned off because of maintenance issues. I guess public education can't afford these sorts of things. But I, I think these sorts of features need to be sustained. We had a couple of speakers here tonight who spoke in support of recommissioning. I don't think many people would like to see it gone and you know, it's it's a part of the local history. So I do think my focus would be recommissioning. Yeah, if we get out other bits like bicycle parking, I guess that'd be great. But my support is pretty much in the position of recommissioning it, upgrading it if it needs to be, replacing whatever parts, you know, the water reticulation bit on the garden. I have no idea. Um, leave that to the experts, but I, I support the visual aspect of it. It's a feature of Oatley and we need to retain these things. Thank you, Councillor Lansbury. Councillors, any further discussion on the motion? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. All those against, I declare that carried. We now move on to questions with notice. First, uh, we've got three questions with notice. Um, first question is from Councillor Lou. Councillor Lou, do you have any further questions? Oh, thank you, Ms. May. No further questions. Uh, thank you for the answers to, to my uh, question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lu. Uh, second question we've noticed regarding Hurstville Memorial Square. Councillor Wang, any further questions? So uh, I, I just want to know if, uh, through you, Ms. Mayor, if there's any progress for the detailed design of the shape. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, yeah, we have made some progress. Uh, we'll be sharing some of that um, that information with councillors in the community over the next week or so. Th thank you. So next week or so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wang. Uh, the next uh, question we've noticed is uh, 003, update on the traffic study proposed for the area surrounding Oatley Railway Station. Councillor Marnie, any further questions? No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, there being none. Uh, that brings us to the end of the business paper and the agenda, and I declare the meeting closed at 9.38pm. Thank you, councillors.